On the morning of January 5, 1943, 18 miles south of Cape Hunter off Guadalcanal, the sea was calm and silver under a rising sun as Lt. Red Cochrane stood at the aft 5-inch-38 caliber battery aboard the light cruiser USS Helena, his crew still shaking off the fatigue of general quarters after the night's bombardment of Japanese positions around Munda. They had barely secured from action when four Japanese D-3A Val dive bombers, their engines droning like angry hornets, emerged low over the water, streaked across the task force, and vanished into the morning haze after a blistering 90-second attack run. One Val had found its mark, the New Zealand cruiser HMNZS Achilles, while the other three fled toward the horizon at wave-top altitude, already two miles away and pulling farther with every passing second. Standard doctrine said to let them go. No American gunnery manual recommended taking a shot at retreating aircraft at that range. Hitting a small maneuvering plane under those conditions was statistically impossible. Barely a 5% chance of even getting close. But on this morning, something aboard Helena was different. Commander D. Parsons, a naval ordnance specialist from the Office of Scientific Research and Development, stood near the battery observing intently. He had traveled from Washington with 500 rounds of secret ammunition loaded under armed guard two months earlier, rounds equipped with mysterious fuses that no gunner fully understood. They looked ordinary, five inches long, threaded into the nose of a 54-pound high-explosive shell, but the brass felt subtly heavier, and if held close to the ear, a faint electrical hum whispered from inside. Parsons had waited months for the right moment. Now, watching those three valves fleeing low over open water, he quietly authorized the use of the experimental rounds. Cochrane ordered three salvos. The first missed entirely. The second missed by fifty feet, bursting harmlessly behind the trailing val. But then, impossibly, one of the shells detonated in midair, not from impact and not on a timer, but as if it knew exactly where the target was. The burst appeared thirty feet off the val's tail, close enough for the shockwave and shrapnel cone to tear through its tail assembly and shred its left wing. The Japanese plane flipped inverted, plunged into the sea at 200 miles per hour, and exploded in a geyser of foam and flames. For a heartbeat, the gunners stared in stunned silence. They had seen a shell explode near an aircraft without hitting it. They had witnessed something that should have been impossible. The first combat success of the proximity fuse, a technology that would change naval warfare forever. The need for such a weapon had been painfully clear since December 7, 1941. During the attack on Pearl Harbor, American anti-aircraft batteries fired thousands of rounds with almost no effect. At 0758 that morning, aboard USS Oklahoma, Ensign John Charles England, the ship's damage control officer, watched the battleship's five-inch guns blaze skyward, their timed fuses set for 3,000 to 5,000 feet, while Japanese torpedo bombers screamed in at barely 1,500 feet. Shells burst harmlessly thousands of feet above their targets. England continued directing teams as torpedoes slammed into Oklahoma's port side, one hit, then another, then another, each blast tearing open steel until water rushed in unchecked. As the ship listed further and men slid across the tilted deck, England kept sending sailors to seal compartments and kept returning into the flooding interior to pull trapped men out. He saved at least three before Oklahoma finally rolled over, entombing him and 415 others. If American anti-aircraft fire had worked, maybe some of those torpedo planes would have been stopped before releasing their weapons. But timed fuses demanded perfection, perfect altitude estimates, perfect range calculations, perfect mechanical settings. In real combat, nothing was ever perfect. The math was merciless. A five-inch shell with a contact fuse only worked if it hit an airplane, an almost impossible feat against a fast, weaving aircraft while a ship rolled on the ocean. Timed fuses were only slightly better. The gunner estimated altitude, spun a dial, and hoped the shell would explode near the target. But rangefinders jittered, 
radar was crude, fire control computers produced errors of 50 feet or more, and pilots jinked unpredictably. The result? Shells burst hundreds of feet away, useless. During the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, USS Enterprise fired 1,200 rounds of 5-inch ammunition and shot down just two planes. Across the Pacific, Cavita Naval Yard, the dry-docked submarine USS Celian, the carriers Lexington and Yorktown, the story was the same. Thousands of rounds, minimal kills, ships sunk, and sailors dead. Something had to change. The solution had begun quietly in August 1940 in Washington, where physicist Merle Tuve, a brilliant, stubborn innovator, accepted a task most engineers considered impossible. Design a fuse that could sense a nearby aircraft and detonate automatically. The constraints bordered on insanity. The entire device had to fit in a 5-inch shell nose, survive 20,000 gs of acceleration, withstand 25,000 revolutions per minute of spin, operate in extreme temperatures, contain a radio transmitter, a receiver, a miniature antenna, a detonator, and a battery, and still be simple enough to mass-produce by the hundreds of thousands. British and German scientists had already tried and failed. Radio tubes shattered under launch forces. Circuits snapped. Batteries leaked. Every attempt ended in failure. But Tuve's team, Section T, refused to quit. They partnered with Sylvania Electric to build a new generation of rugged miniature vacuum tubes, thicker glass, tiny shock-mounted filaments, redesigned internal supports. Hundreds shattered during testing. Engineers fired tubes in centrifuges repeatedly until only a handful survived. Slowly, failure rates dropped from 90% to 10%. They created a reserve battery that activated only after firing, when a glass ampoule broke under G-force and released its electrolyte. They turned the fuse's brass casing into a functional antenna. They built three independent safety systems so the fuse could never arm accidentally. And they trained an army of women in factories across America to assemble these delicate electronic masterpieces, 130 components each, under strict secrecy rivaling the Manhattan Project. Every fuse was tested. Every failure dissected. By January 1943, they had 5,000 working units. Tests came next. At Dahlgren Proving Ground and over Chesapeake Bay, the Navy fired proximity-fused shells at radio-controlled drones. Planners expected days of troubleshooting. Instead, the tests ended in 90 minutes. Three drones were shot down with four shells. The Navy canceled further trials. The technology worked, and it worked brilliantly. That was how 500 rounds ended up aboard USS Helena, escorted across the Pacific by Commander Parsons, each crate labeled Top Secret. The gunners called them Spooky Shells. And on January 5th, they proved their worth with a single impossible kill. Word spread fast. Enterprise and Saratoga used proximity fuses in February 1943, downing six torpedo bombers with just 84 shells. By spring, every major ship in the Pacific demanded them. Production exploded. Crosley, RCA, Kodak, GE, Sylvania. 110 factories producing 40,000 fuses a day by late 1943. 22 million would be manufactured by war's end. Their effectiveness transformed naval warfare. In 1943, proximity fuses accounted for only 25% of anti-aircraft rounds fired, but delivered over half of all kills. During the brutal kamikaze attacks at Okinawa, ships with proximity-fused ammunition had a 70% higher survival rate. The destroyer USS Hugh W. Hadley, attacked by 156 enemy aircraft in 90 minutes on May 11, 1945, survived only because its 5-inch guns, firing proximity fuses exclusively, detonated shells with lethal precision before kamikazes could strike. Even when German intelligence captured 20,000 of the fuses at Malmedy during the Battle of the Bulge and examined them, 
Their own procurement experts dismissed the technology as impossible. They believed vacuum tubes could not survive the forces involved. They filed the report away. No countermeasures were ever developed. By then, it was too late. The proximity fuse, born from physics, desperation, and relentless innovation, had rewritten the rules of anti-aircraft warfare. And it all began the moment Lieutenant Red Cochrane watched an impossible Madeira explosion tear a fleeing dive bomber out of the sky, not with a lucky hit, but with a shell that could think.